Jews, if you look to Europe, a continent of enlightenment, you find that it is very commonly believed that Jews have too much power in finance and business. In fact, on the order of 40% of people of the European Union believe this, 200 million people. Now you hear this, and you've, many of you have heard such statements before, and you can kind of gloss over it and say, okay, so people say this kind of thing, and others don't gloss over and they say it's true. But we should step back and ask ourselves what this really means and interrogate this statement, Jews have too much power in finance. The first thing we should say is what do they mean by that? What are Jews doing with this alleged power that they have? What kind of threat does it pose that you would even talk about it this way as that Jews having too much power? And why in countries where the Jewish community is infinitesimal, less than 1% in every European country, sometimes 0.1%, sometimes smaller, tiny, tiny communities with tiny communities of business people. Why, how can they possibly believe that these tiny groups of business people have too much power such that you would believe Jews have too much power in business and finance? Why, we might ask, are the business people even seen as Jewish business people? After all, Jewish businessmen and businesswomen do what Jewish businessmen and businesswomen do everywhere, which is to make products, sell them, seek profit, get their companies to grow, their portfolios, what have you. What about their business dealings is Jewish or what makes their Jewishness relevant to it? And getting back to a question I already posed, what exactly are they worried about that Jews might do with their alleged too much power? I should point out that this is believed in country after country, in country after country where Jews were slaughtered, where people from that country, non-Jews, took a hand in the slaughter of Jews, where Jews were obviously enormously powerless. And also this is commonly believed in countries where the business community the non-Jewish business community, which I should say the business community, which of course includes Jews, have not bathed themselves in glories. Take the Swiss, for example. This is a very widespread view. So the simple statement that people gloss over, Jews have too much power in business, really, when we interrogate it, reveals a lot about the depth and character of anti-Semitism. It's a strange thing for people to believe, where there are virtually no Jews. It's a constant theme, it's an old theme, it's a new theme. One of the questions about anti-Semitism today is how old is it? Or is it the same as we've had before? Or is it something new? Well, this is old and it's new. It's both. Some other features are one or the other. If we move from Europe and look, in the middle, look to the Middle East and the Islamic world, we find that it is commonly believed, commonly intoned, in fact, even much more commonly than the notion that Jews have too much power in business, that Jews are the children of apes and pigs. This, of course, is part of the Quranic tradition. It's in the Quran itself. It is such a commonplace of Islamic and Arab countries that it is, that it, it is a barely noticed statement. It's like saying Allah is great. It is said so frequently. These, of course, are ancient sources. Nothing new about this. They've been activated or reactivated in the last several decades and become a powerful trope that dehumanizes Jews. It robs them of essential human elements. They're not even human beings. the children of apes and pigs. Notice that this dehumanization of Jews is different from the notion that Jews have too much power in business, which is a kind of demonization of Jews. They're human beings, but they have demonic qualities. Both dehumanization and demonization are common features of anti-Semitism today. If we move back to the first world, this time to the US and Britain, we find that it is commonly said that a Jewish cabal or Jewish conspiracy or an Israel lobby is running the US or Britain. This of course became most well known through the book The Israel Lobby in this country and during the run-up and during the early years 
of the Iraq War, where it said that it was a war that Jews serving Israel instigated the U.S. and Britain to fight. Nonsense, of course, but it was said and believed. A true kind of demonization. Jews in this country are betraying their countrymen, countrywomen, are traitors to their country, are getting young American men and women to die for the cause of Jews in Israel. That's how demonic Jews are said to be. If we move beyond the first world and beyond the Middle East and the Islamic world and look to the rest of the world, we find alarming numbers. In Brazil, in Latin America, 50% of the people are anti-Semitic. There are virtually no Jews in Brazil. 50% are anti-Semitic, according to surveys. In Nigeria, where again, there are really virtually no Jews, 43% of the people are anti-Semitic. In China, the population and economic colossus of the world, 55% of the people are anti-Semitic. And there are no Jews in China except for a handful of foreigners, basically. Jews today are fleeing Europe. There's, there are many European leaders, and I share this view, who think that there is not much of a future for Jews in Europe. They're under such siege, and I'll say more about that in a bit. They're actually leaving the countries, going to Israel, the US, Canada, wherever they can go, or they're staying, hiding their identities, fleeing inwardly. Their community centers and institutions are bunkers or fortresses. They live in fear. And finally, if we turn to Israel, the country that is home to many Jews, a Jewish country, Israel is the object of something that no other country is the object of, an international eliminationist coalition, a coalition of countries, institutions, and people that seek to destroy it in one way or another. Some have peaceful ways of destroying it, and others would like literally to destroy it and slaughter its people. That is the ultimate danger and the focal point for that danger that faces Jews today. Now, as alarming as what I have just laid out in giving you this very quick and episodic tour of the world, it does not begin to convey the character of what people believe and say, what is commonly believed and said. So let me read you just a few brief passages so you get a sense of the passion and the thought and the demonology. Intoxicated mentally by the messianic dream of a greater Israel, that's the Jews, they're, intox they're intoxicated mentally by a messianic dream of a greater Israel, which will finally achieve the expansionist dreams of the most radical Zionism, contaminated by the monstrous and rooted certitude that in this catastrophic and absurd world there exists a people chosen by God and that consequently all the actions of an obsessive, psychological and pathologically exclusivist racism are justified. Educated, this continues about the Jews, educated and trained in the idea that any suffering that has been inflicted or is being inflicted or will be inflicted on everyone else, especially the Palestinians, will always be inferior to that which they themselves suffered in the Holocaust. The Jews endlessly scratch their own wound to keep it bleeding. So they're doing it willfully. They're keeping their wounds bleeding willfully to make it incurable, and they show it to the world as if it were a banner. Israel seizes hold of the terrible words of God in Deuteronomy, vengeance is mine, and I will be repaid. Israel wants all of us to feel guilty, directly or indirectly, for the horrors of the Holocaust. Israel wants us to renounce the most elemental critical judgment and for us to transform ourselves into the docile echo of its will. Israel, in short, is a racist state by virtue of Judaism's monstrous doctrines, racist not just against the Palestinians, but against the entire world, which it seeks to manipulate and abuse. Israel struggles with its neighbors, seen in that light, do take on a unique and even metaphysical quality of genuine evil 
the quality that distinguishes Israel's struggles from those of all other nations with disputed borders, no matter what the statistics of death and suffering might suggest. Now, if I told you that this was a Friday sermon by an impassioned anti-Semitic iman, I imagine you'd believe me. Or if it was the statement of a passionately anti-Semitic political Islamist leader from Iran, for example, I imagine many of you would believe me. But what will surprise you to hear is that this came from the pen of no one less than a Nobel Prize winner in literature, Jose Saramago, which was published in 2002 in, Spain, in one of Spain's and Europe's leading newspapers, El País. Imagine, ask the question, this is one of the kinds of questions we should ask ourselves, against what other people would a Nobel Prize winner in literature write such a thing, a Nazi-like thing, worthy of Hitler? And against what other people would a leading newspaper, the New York Times of a country, publish such a thing? It's a rhetorical question that answers itself. This is a statement which European elites across the continent could nod and did nod, I'm sure, and say, well, he may go a bit overboard, but what he's telling are essential truths, and he has the courage to say what the rest of us think. Now, if we go from Saramago, who lays out how to think about the Jews and what their putative evil is, to the heart of the anti-Semitic world, the heart in the Middle East, in Hamas, and listen to the Hamas leader, Mashal, who affirmed after their election victory in 2006, which led to their takeover of Gaza, that he had an unalterable plan, and they had an unalterable plan to destroy Israel. Israel. After he affirmed that, he said in a chilling address at a Friday mosque, again, this is to a religious institution and its worshipers, put yourselves in mindset, a religious institution devoted to higher values, God and his glory. He affirmed that the plan for Hamas unalterably was to destroy Israel. His speech moved the worshipers, these religious worshipers, to chant, death to Israel, death to Israel, death to America. And Mashal responded that death was not good enough. Before Israel dies, he said, it must be humiliated and degraded. Allah willing, before they die, they will experience humiliation and degradation every day. So not just once, but every day. Tortured, that's what he's saying. Allah willing, we will make them lose their eyesight, we will make them lose their brains. From what political leader of what group can you hear such a statement about any other group in the world or any other people or country? The vividness, the cruelty, the, the call for the suffering before the slaughter. And it's not just, of course, Mashal, the leader of Hamas, but the ordinary suicide bomber who shares his views and expresses why he or she sometimes does what he does. They, they create video testaments and post them. And here is one that was posted on the Hamas website when it opened. My message to the low Jews is that there's no God but Allah. We will chase you everywhere. It's the Jews, it's not just Israelis, it's the Jews. We are a nation that drinks blood and we know that there is no blood better than the blood of Jews. We will not leave you alone until we have quenched our thirst with your blood and our children's thirst with your blood. This is a co these are common places of the Arab and Islamic world. I haven't gone out and found the two or three exceptional quotes that people sometimes do when they want to make a point. This is, these are truisms of belief and intoned again and again. And if there's any doubt that they mean Jews and not just Israelis and Israel, Listen to Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, who for quite a long while was the superstar of the Arab and Islamic world 
for their resistance and their claimed victory against Israel in the war in Lebanon. For Hezbollah, the term Jewish is such an epithet that they use that instead of Zionist. It's not enough to call someone a Zionist, you call him Jewish, that's worse in their view. And he said, if we search the entire world for a person more cowardly, despicable, weak, and feeble in psyche, mind, ideology, and religion, we would not find anyone like the Jew. Notice, I do not say the Israeli. He wanted to make it clear he and the others are talking about Jews. This is a character from Saramago to Mashal to the suicide bomber, bomber to Nasrallah of what anti-Semites are saying and what they believe and what they would do. Not every anti-Semite would do these sorts of things, but what many of them would do. And what I've given you are just nuggets, the proverbial tip of the iceberg. They're just, if you're interested, go to Memory, M-E-M-R-I, the website that, that tracks and translates and publishes video and transcripts and articles from anti-Semites across the Arab and Islamic world, and you will find endless, endless things like this. And I open with all this, much of which should be a commonplace, because people simply aren't aware of what's out there. They hear, oh yeah, there's anti-Semites, of course, you know, Arabs don't like Jews, whatever, what can you do? Uh, and yeah, and I'm sure, you know, in Europe and among leftists there's some stuff, but there's a flood of it, and this is its character, and it's all over the world. People aren't aware, even reasonably informed, well-informed people aren't aware, and particularly in this country, because this country is rather exceptional, where a lot of Jews live in relatively free or anti-Semitically free existences, and they don't face this on a daily basis. And it's more comfortable to deny it than to look at it in the eye and to look at it for what it is, such as, what does it mean to say Jews have too much power in business? What is the set of beliefs behind such a statement? And many people want to deny it, and they attack those who raise the alarm, which is a commonplace. And of course, people want to blame it all on Israel so they can wish away the problem. This is for Jews who don't want to confront the problem, and of course, for all the anti-Semites who don't want to acknowledge that they really don't like Jews, or they don't want to acknowledge it publicly, because that still is not acceptable. So if we want to try to understand contemporary anti-Semitism, we need to, there are lots of questions we need to ask and answer, and I can't do it all tonight. What exactly is it? Why it exists and what causes it? How it functions? How it's been transformed in the last few decades and what it is today? There are many confusions and misdirections that are out there about the oldest and longest standing form of profound ethnic prejudice, the most tenacious, most virulent, most murderous prejudice in history. And so we need to confront it directly and including its form today if we want to understand it and eventually to combat it. And so one thing that one should keep in mind is that whatever form anti-Semitism has taken historically and today, whether it's been in the Christian world in medieval times or the Arab world or in Europe today or in the United States today, whatever, there is something that is common. It takes many forms, has many different accusations. Sometimes they, what, the anti-Semitism of one era seems to have nothing to do with the anti-Semitism of another era or era, area or era. But there is something in common. There's something that is called the foundational anti-Semitic paradigm that is to be found in all anti-Semitism. It's the core of what anti-Semitism is and conveys. And it has five elements. That Jews are fundamentally different from non-Jews. That they are noxious in some way, in some significant way, that they are, have noxious or pernicious qualities, that they willfully do harm, that they are powerful, and that therefore they are dangerous. This is the anti foundational anti-Semitic paradigm, and all anti-Semitisms are built upon it. And once you recognize this, you can rethink the nature of anti-Semitism through the ages, which I'm not going to do right now, except to say that what we have today is something qualitatively different from before. It's anti-Semitism has entered its third era. The first two are the long Christian era and parallel Islamic era. Then came the second modern racial era starting the 19th century, which culminated in Nazism and the Holocaust. 
And today, anti-Semitism in the last few decades has morphed into a new form that can be called global anti-Semitism. It's everywhere in the world in the way it wasn't before. It has new features. It has relentlessly international its orientation. And I'll say more about it. We're in that era. And one of the features of that era is that many of the streams of anti-Semitism that I've mentioned, leftist, rightist, Islamic, Christian, which were relatively separate from one another, even if they were grounded in, if they were built upon this paradigm, have in global anti-Semitism come together into one global amalgam. They each influence another, they share ideas, they appeal to one another. One of the common tropes, again, amazingly not very well known, is that Palestinians, including in the Palestinian Authority, regularly, routinely, liken Palestinians and Palestine to Jesus. Palestine is the Jesus on the cross of today. This is, of course, done by, people, by peoples who are overwhelmingly Muslim and don't have a great deal of fondness for Christians, to say the least. But this is a way to appeal to Europeans and to Christians. And so this is a, one of the most commonly put forward images by Palestinian propaganda. Let's look at the numbers. It's global. In Europe, there are more than 250 million people by any reasonable definition of what anti-Semitism is who are anti-Semitic. That's an enormous number of people, 250 million people. We have surveys that repeatedly show this to be the case. In Asia, Africa, Latin America, where we have fewer surveys and they're less in-depth, but nonetheless indicative, if you look at the countries that have been surveyed, which includes most of the major ones population-wise, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, and so on, you have at least 1.5 billion anti-Semites. And in the Arab and Islamic world, there are hundreds of millions of the 1.3 billion Muslims. There are, one, there are hundreds of millions, we don't know, there are very few surveys. They show the countries that have been surveyed that almost 100% of the people are anti-Semitic. So there are, there are certainly hundreds of millions of anti-Semites in the Arab and Islamic world. This is phenomenal. There are very few Jews in the world. Why would people in China, in India, in Japan have profoundly negative views of Jews? Why would there be this prejudice? You know, if you step back, again, I, I, I frequently say step back and think. Step back and think about what the world should be like. There should be no prejudice against Jews. We don't have prejudice and worldwide prejudice against most groups of people. Where's the worldwide prejudice that you would do surveys in country after country against Turks or Kurds whom they persecute? Or name group after group and country after country only pretty much about Jews. And the numbers are in the hundreds of millions and billions. Now, I've said it's not caused by Israel. I'm going to dwell on this for a moment because this is one of the most common, th commonly said, incorrect, and indeed mendacious things about anti-Semitism. It's just Israel. If Israel didn't do the horrible things it did, we all know what the litany supposedly is. And this is, of course, and I say, of course, of course, of course, of course it means it doesn't mean we can't criticize Israel and we can't disagree with governmental policies and so on. Of course one can. It's the manner in which people do it, the obsessiveness with which they do it, the hallucinatory nature with which they do it that makes people, that makes it clear that it's anti-Semitism. But let me first tell you why we should not think that this anti-Semitism is caused by Israel. Jews have too much power in business. We've talked about that. Between 200 and 280 million Europeans believe this. Nothing to do with Israel. Jews have too much power in business. Jews have too much power in general, nothing to do with Israel. Jews have too much influence in the international financial markets. 200 million people in the EU believe that, nothing to do with Israel. That's actually focused on American Jews. Jews care only about their own kind, nothing to do with Israel. 200 million Europeans believe that. Jews speak out too much about the Holocaust. Again, 40% of the EU, 200 million. Europeans believe that, nothing to do with Israel. Jews are guilty for the death of Jesus. A hundred million people in Europe still believe that today. And rec keep in mind that Europe is the most secularized region in the world. 
where only a, sm a relatively small percentage of people even believe in or belong to and believe, belong to Christian churches or believe in the Christian theology. And yet, 100 million people say Jews are guilty today for the death of Jesus. Nothing to do with Israel. And if you look specifically at a recent event, it's very interesting and indicative. In the global financial crisis, okay, say Jews have too much power in business or they care about their own kind. You don't even know any Jews. Because most Europeans don't. Most anti-Semites historically and around the world today have never known Jews. All they know is what they hear and learn from their families, in their communities, from the media today. So they believe these things about Jews. They've heard them. Okay, it's terrible, but you can get it. You can understand it. The global financial crisis. There is. It's hard to think about any recent event about which there was more immediate reporting better reporting, more wall-to-wall -wall coverage, in country after country, more acute attention by everyone from, from, from whatever place in the socioeconomic hierarchy people were, whatever position in society they were, everybody was riveted on it. We know, we knew quite early on the basics of it, what caused it. And yet, when Europeans were surveyed about the global financial crisis, 30 percent, 150 million people said that Jews were responsible for it. What kind of profoundly anti-Semitic beliefs must they have had to overcome the evidence of the, the overwhelming evidence that was coming in to them about sovereign debt in Europe, about the mortgage back, about the mortgage and housing crisis in this country, and so on and so forth, that they would say the Jews are responsible for it. That's how profound the anti-Semitism in Europe is. If one moves to Israel for a moment, you find really a view that is one might call fantastical, one might call hallucinatory. It's so divorced from reality that it's hard to understand it, except that we must confront it. 55% of the people of the European Union, totally 275 million people, say that, that Israel and Jews are conducting a war of extermination against the Palestinians. Now, what everyone thinks about Israel's policy, there is no reasonable or no even unreasonable but still in touch with the reality way to say that they're conducting a war of extermination. And in a country where people know quite well what a war of extermination is, Germany, 57% of the people say that Israel and Jews are conducting war of extermination against the Palestinians. Now usually when I discuss anti-Semitism, I don't try to refute the anti-Semites. It's a losing game. Oh, Jews really aren't that bad. Look, they give for philanthropy. They do this, and so on. It, it doesn't work, and it's, and it's not the issue. And we don't analyze. You don't look at what Jews do in order to try to understand anti-Semitism, whether what the Jews, Jews are doing as individuals or as a community are things you like or don't like, because Jews' conduct fundamentally has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. You look at the anti-Semites in their communities and their worlds to try to understand them, and so there's no point writing about Jews if you're writing about anti-Semitism. But here I'll just give you two facts. From 1990 to 2008, the Palestinian population in the occupied territories doubled. And from 1998 to 2008, they had one of the highest growth rates in the world. How can anyone say that Israel is conducting a war of extermination? Population doubled. And during that period, during the last 10 years, Israelis or Jewish Israelis killed about 6,500 Palestinians, a big number. And Palestinians killed about 1,000 Israelis, also a big number, smaller, but a big number. But however you look at that, it's nothing like a war of extermination, yet this is commonly believed, hallucinatory. Now, if when staying on the subject of Israel, is Israel the core cause of anti Semitism? Well, that they are deemed to be descendants of apes and pigs in the Quran and throughout the Arab and Islamic world has nothing to do with Israel, has ancient sources. 
that they were said, that they're routinely said to have betrayed Muhammad, tried to poison him, killed the prophets. These are just intoned again and again, Friday prayers, time after time, and also in media. Nothing to do with Israel. In the United States, that Jews, the United States, 100 million people believe that Jews have dual loyalty, an age-old charge that Jews are more loyal to Jews than they are Jews abroad to Jews uh, to their own countrymen. This, of course, is more commonly believed in Europe than the U.S., but still, 30% of the American public believes this, 100 million people. But what we can say about the United States is that the picture here is much better than Europe. There's been a marked decline in anti-Semitism here, while everywhere in Europe it's on the upsurge in, in the last two decades. If you look at surveys of anti-Semitic no, of anti-Semitism in this country, in 1964, the, when the first systematic survey was taken, 30% of Americans believed multiple interlocking anti-Semitic notions about Jews. Today, it's 15%. A bad number. I mean, this is what you have to say about anti-Semitism. 15%, that's a big number. That's a lot of people. It's terrible. There shouldn't be this kind of prejudice. It's a legacy of age-old and contemporary whipping up of anti-Jewish fervor. But it's declined. It's half of what it was, and it's much lower than it is in Europe. So in that sense, the U.S. looks really good. The growth of anti-Semitism, which as I've said, has taken off in the last two decades, does not map Israel's conduct. In fact, anti-Semitism transformed itself into its global form and, and started its enormous upsurge in the 1990s, the time that was most hopeful for a, set, for a settlement of the Middle East conflict during the Oslo process. Whatever you or I may think about the Oslo process, those were the years when more people around the world, more governments around the world, were favorably disposed towards what was going on in, in Israel and in the, Israel's relations with Palestinians and surrounding countries than at any other time, yet that's when anti-Semitism took off. It's not a reaction to Israel's conduct. And if you look again at a very specific historical moment where we can see the effect of Israel upon anti-Semitism, which was Operation Cast Lead, Israel's incursion into Gaza, which was perhaps the most universally and vociferously condemned policy or military action by Israel of all time, and which led to an enormous upsurge in anti-Semitic attacks. There, were more, there was a huge spike in anti-Semitic attacks upon Jews and their institutions around the world during the, during, during the operation and in its aftermath. Nevertheless, we have surveys of underlying anti-Semitic beliefs in Europe right before and right after Operation Cast Lead, and anti-Semitism did not budge. Up one percentage point in one country, down a point or two in another country, even level in a third. And so even though Israel was roundly and bitterly condemned across the world, around the world, it did not affect the underlying beliefs about Jews that exist in Europe. Again, a clear indication that it's not Israel that's producing anti-Semitism, but it's anti-Semites and the propagation of their beliefs among themselves, to their children, and to others in their communities and around their, and around their countries and their worlds that is responsible for anti-Semitism. But that doesn't mean that anti-Semites are not focused on Israel. They are. Israel is the absolute focal point and obsessive central concern of anti-Semitism. Anti-Israelism, or anti-Zionism, it's called both, is clearly anti-Semitism, whatever those who propagate it would pretend otherwise. In my book, The Devil That Never Dies, that was mentioned, I have a long chapter on this. And I catalog all the ways in which what those who allegedly are just against Israel or Zionism but not anti-Semitic do, uh, do and say about Jews, do towards and say about Jews, that constitutes anti-Semitism and, and, and which has no parallels against any other country, which is one of the hallmarks of a prejudice. 
I mentioned that 50% of Europeans believe that Israel is conducting a war of extermination. Anti-Semitic, flat out. There's no other way to look at it. It's the product of hatred of Jews and hallucinatory or fantastical beliefs about Jews, which is what anti-Semitism is. This desire to eliminate Israel, this eliminationist coalition, has no parallel today on a small scale, let alone a large scale. And what has happened, and this again is not usually conceptualized this way, is that the destruction of a country has become, and the propagation of views to demean the people of the country, to deprecate them, to demonize them, and not just people in the country, but people related to them around the world, are part of this, are at the center of the foreign policy planks and programs of a large number of countries. They push it internationally. Against no other country in the world can you say such a thing. So anti-Semitism is focused on Israel. It's not caused by Israel and it's not caused by reality as the extermination belief shows. If reality were causing prejudice, and many people say that it is, that while anti-Semitism is a reaction against Jews, to what they do, maybe it's an overreaction, but it's Jews are responsible, I've already addressed this. Let's look at some realities. In Lebanon, there was a war that lasted a very long time between Muslims and Christians, in which 100,000 people in a, in a country of four million people were killed. It's an enormous number. Every family was touched, all people were touched, communities were destroyed, everybody was imperiled. There was great bitterness. Yet in a recent survey, we find that among Muslims, depending on the Shia or Sunni, 14 to 17 percent of them, 14 to 17, 1, 7 percent of them have an unfavorable view of Christians despite all this killing. Yet 97 percent of them have an unfavorable view of Jews. Israel has not wreaked half, one, a small, a small, not even a small iota of the damage to Lebanon and kill the number of people that Christians and Muslims have done to one another. It's not caused by reality. The prejudice is caused by prejudice. I've mentioned Turks and Kurds. The Turks have treated the Kurds in ways that far exceed in brutality and murderousness and destructiveness than, the, than by any objective measure Israel has treated the Palestinians. Yet we don't have any international anti-Turkism. We don't have anything like the obsessive hatred directed, that's directed at Israel focused on Turkey. This prejudice against Jews is not caused by reality because if it were the reality of the Turks' treatment of Kurds and not to mention the Armenians, this great slaughter of the Armenians before them and of many others over the decades would have produced a great prejudice, it hasn't. And then think of the, the people who should have suffered the greatest prejudice of all, perhaps, internationally in recent times, the Germans. I'm not saying should have in the sense that I'm advocating it, I'm not. The Germans slaughtered not only the Jews of Europe, but slaughtered millions of non-Jews, conquered the European continent, subjected country after country and people after people to immense brutality. I could go on for a long time and characterize it, but it's well known. All the peoples of Europe, pretty much suffered at their hands. And look how quickly the hatred of Germans dissipated after the war. Of course there's prejudice against Germans and they'll be called Nazis and so on, but it's so superficial. It lasted for such a brief period, despite all the genuine and immense suffering Germany caused the continent and really threatened the extinction of civilization. The prejudice against Jews is not caused by Israel, it's not caused by reality in the sense of being a reaction to what Jews or Israel does. And yet it is everywhere, as I've said. It's not just everywhere in the sense that you find it in, 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 on all continents and across country, in continent after continent, and among so many peoples in such large numbers, but it's everywhere because it's all over the internet. It's all over digital media, media satellite television, and radio. It's a few clicks away for anyone. Just think, a child, innocent, or neo-Nazi, or right-winger, who's not innocent, says, let me find out about Jews. Types in Jew, the word Jew, into Bing or Google. And depending on what day you type 
the word in, the second, third, or fourth sight that comes up is a site called Jew Watch, which is dedicated to the dissemination of hatred, it says truth, about Jews. It claims to have two billion pages of information, who knows how many it really has. It's organized into categories, such as Zionist occupied governments, Jewish genocides today and yesterday, Jewish leaders, conspirators, power lords, Jewish atrocities, Jewish communist rulers and killers, Jewish mind control mechanisms, and on and on and on and on. And as the innocent child clicks on it and descends into a netherworld of hatred and fantasy and bigotry of anti-Semitism. And existing anti-Semites do further reading and research to develop, to buttress their views and to learn new things. It's everywhere. It flows everywhere the way globalization does. One of the features of the global world is that information, goods, services, they flow in every direction. There's no one path, there's no center periphery relationship as there once was, from the European center flowing outward to the rest of the world. Anti-Semitism flows everywhere, it is everywhere on the internet. There's no single place to go and combat it. We used to have an address for anti-Semitism, it was called the Vatican, you knew where to go to fight it. There is no place, it's everywhere. It is part of the substructure of the world of prejudice, that much harder to eradicate, as hard as it was to eradicate, and it wasn't eradicated historically. It's not just global in its reach, in the numbers of people, in that it's everywhere in the internet and satellite, television. It also has new features that mimic the world today, and this is and this is, is an important aspect of anti-Semitism, which sometimes is confused. It's not that, even though anti-Semites aren't grounded in reality, they do pick up on, f on features of reality. So when Jews are weak, Jews are portrayed as cunning and conniving behind the scenes because you can't present them as being strong and powerful in a manifest way. It doesn't mean the Jews' weakness is causing anti-Semitism or that Jews' cleverness, whatever that is, is causing anti-Semitism, but they latch on to real features. And so anti-Semites have had dominant images through the ages, from Shylock to Rothschild, the plutocratic banking family, particularly the 19th century, today to the Jew as Rambo, because Israel is a powerful military country, a local regional superpower, with the dominant images being that of Jews grinding up Palestinians and meat grinders, Jewish soldiers with their boots on the neck of Palestinian children or crushing their heads. The imagery of anti-Semitism has changed. It's become more ferocious. It's radically different from before. It's one of the features of our global anti-Semitism today. And it is more deadly than ever, which is hard to say, or hard perhaps to believe, given that the Holocaust, the Germans perpetrated the Holocaust not that long ago. It is more deadly in the sense that in Arab and Islamic countries, the bloodlust, the calls for mass killing, what we would call mass murder, are open, are regular, are routine, are the norm. The Nazis were much more circumspect. The stuff I read and that you can read or hear on a daily basis in Arab and Islamic countries was never said publicly and openly by the Nazis in this way. Of course, they believed it. They said it among themselves and they did it. But they were much more restrained for a variety of reasons. The bloodlust, the murderousness is open. The calls for the annihilation of the Jews, it's part of the Hamas charter, which Hamas affirms again and again. You've heard it from Ahmadinejad. It's a little bit coded form. Wipe Israel off the map and so on. Ask yourselves, if you haven't already, looking at the fruits of the Arab Spring, sad as it is, and what's going on in Syria and has gone in other countries with the murderousness that's taking place, does anyone really believe that if Israel were defeated militarily, that a fate even worse wouldn't befall the Jews of Israel at the hands of their conquerors? Who, could, who can honestly say that they would not act upon with, with passion and, and systematic action upon their murderous proclamations today and wishings and fantasies and hopes and dreams and the things that they teach their children? in the Palestinian Authority, in Gaza, and all over 
the Arab and Islamic world. When I say all over, I don't mean in every corner, but very broadly. M mirroring our global age in which everyone understands today how political most everything is. Economics is politics, it's influenced by politics, it influences politics. Cultural f culture is undergirds politics, it's influenced by politics, and so on and so forth. Anti-Semitism is relentlessly political in the way that it never was before. Focus on Israel, co-opting international institutions, particularly the UN, part of the foreign policies of countries, forming an international eliminationist alliance. There has never been one before. The U.S., as I said, is an exception. One could tell different kinds of stories about the U.S. Compared to Europe, things are much better. If you look at the real nature of the American Jewish community, getting back to reality, which is a much more visible community than in any other country in the world, except for Israel, of course, a much more prominent community, a community willing to stand up for itself and push its own interests the way other American religious and ethnic minorities do, a wealthy community, a politically successful community that has no parallel in any other country. In light of the real nature of the American Jews, which is nothing more than to have their heads up and be seen and not to be ashamed to be Jews, but nevertheless to be visible. And for these age-old charges to seem to, if you want to look at it that way, to have more resonance, it is remarkable how much less anti-Semitism there is in this country than there is in Europe. And how Jews in this country, in this country alone, can stand up and defend their interests without fear of being deemed suspect, of being disloyal to their country because they pursue their, their understanding of theirs and their own country's interests when I'm speaking in support of Israel or their communal lives and values. Now, of course, in the last few years, things have gotten a little less rosy, particularly on college campuses, particularly on the American left, particularly with the growth of the BDS movement to boycott and divest, invest, and to boycott and divest uh, institutions, boycott Israel and divest institutions of their holdings in Israeli companies in Israel. And it's alarming. And there's more, there are more charges in the public sphere about the Israel lobby and so on. But so far, we've succeeded in this country in achieving one thing which has not been done in Europe and which is the one thing that I think that we can reasonably fight for, we being Jews and non-Jews of goodwill. It's not just a fight for Jews or of Jews. It really can't be won by Jews. It has to be won by the non-Jewish community, which is that in this country, we have made it clear that anti-Semitism, as is true of other forms of prejudice, simply has no place in the public sphere of our country. And that anyone who speaks anti-Semitically, just as anyone who speaks openly in a prejudicial way against African Americans or Latinos and so on, is not fit for public life. That doesn't mean there isn't plenty of anti-Semitism. There is. But as long as we keep it out of the public sphere, we've achieved an immense amount because when it's in the public sphere, all the anti-Semites see and all those who might become anti-Semitic or, or vulnerable to it see, oh, there's an important person. Look what he's saying. There's an opinion leader and look what she's telling me about Jews. They get their, the views come across, they get validated, they get furthered, they get intensified. This is a great achievement for Jews and for the broader society that, we have a, that, that, this is a, that this is the condition of the United States for Jews and for Americans in general. It is not true in Europe, and this is something the European elites don't understand, how dangerous this is, and that it's in their interest to be more American in this respect. This is something which is achievable. I'm not saying it will be achieved. I'm not saying it will be easy. It is achievable, and this is something we should all push for. We will not educate people to stop them from being anti-Semitic, we have no influence in most of the world, we, whoever we are. No influence in the Arab and Islamic world. It's very hard to educate, it's really hard to educate people in your own country with a lot of education, not to be whole prejudices which their families and their communities hold. In other countries, it's virtually impossible. But denuding the public sphere of anti-Semitism and making it, making it, this, making, making it impossible for people to have public lives while being, anti, while being openly anti-Semitic is something that's possible and is something we should all work for. 
And to get back to the beginning, the Simon Wiesenthal Center is doing as much as any organization to do precisely this. Their top 10 list of rather recent development has been enormously important and influential and something we should all support and something we should all applaud. Just as we should decry anti-Semitism, Jews and non-Jews alike should come together and fight this prejudice as we fought other prejudices for other, against other groups and make sure that at least in this country and in other countries that are of like quality, that anti-Semitism stays out of our public life and that Jews can be Jews, can be Jewish Americans or German or Jewish Germans, a strange notion, or Jewish Brits or Jewish whatever, as comfortably as their non-Jewish compatriots can be whatever they are. Thank you. A gentleman wrote, thank you, Dr. Goldhagen, which groups like the Jews? The real answer to the question, I think, is very simple, which is all people who are pluralists and all people who are not prejudiced like Jews because they don't dislike them and they don't hold prejudices against them. And we as Jews should want, I'll speak for myself, I as a Jew should want for people to like me as an individual for the things I stand for or to dislike them if they if, if their objections, and that my Jewishness should not in itself be an important marker, an important touchstone for whether pe how people evaluate me or any individual Jew. Only when you're acting as a Jew, when you're engaged in religious practice, if that's what you do, or you're expressing Jewish values in some other way, sh should this be a relevant question? Because we really, I think, and this week I'm sure we could have a spirited discussion about this, we really don't want to be identified as Jews first. A hallmark of prejudice is to reduce an individual in all of his or her complexity to one aspect of his or her identity, the Jewish businessman. What's Jewish about him being a businessman? And if you want to make some general statements that Jews, let's say, study more than non-Jews and therefore we like it, that's fine. You can say things like that. But I don't think that we should be looking for people who, communities that admire Jews because it's not the way we want the world to be organized. A number of people asked me, uh, asked you again, uh, as American Jews, what can we do to stand up to anti-Semitism in America and worldwide? Speak out. When, when you talk to people, you just have to be willing to lay it on the line and correct them. Not everyone is irrational. Many people are poorly informed. It doesn't make them any less anti-Semitic if they happen to believe things that are wrong and that they hold dearly and that fall under the category of prejudice as opposed to just error, then they are anti-Semitic. But many people can be educated by friends. I mean, you know, the proverbial story, uh, I mean, you hear this story so often you know, I used to be homophobic or I used to be anti-gay and then I discovered that I had a nephew who was gay. You know, it changes people's worlds to know someone who is Jewish or who is a member of another, uh, another group against whom there's prejudice. To meet such a person, know such a person, talk to such a person, it's quite humanizing. Since, since every person in the world has anger and hate issues, is it possible that everyone needs a Jew as an outlet? There are many, many people in this world who have prejudices and hatreds and, and, uh, against other peoples. But anti-Semitism, and I didn't go into this in the talk, and I certainly could go on at great length with this, has several, has many distinctive features that make it different from other prejudices. It's tenacity, I mentioned that. It's longevity. It's the qualities attributed to Jews are so much more divorced from reality than most prejudices are, which which all, all are distortions of reality, but they, they hew much more closely to the world in which we live than anti-Semitism does. Jews have been believed to be devils or minions of the devil, literally devils, for centuries and centuries. During the Nazi period, Jews were believed by Germans and many other Europeans not to be human beings, literally to be, to be anti-humans, like the Antichrist in human form. And similar things are believed about Jews in Israel and the United States and so on and, and today and all, with all other kinds, many other kinds of hallucinatory views. What we need to understand is why 
anti-Semitism is different in its quality and why it is, exists on such a vast scale when there's so few Jews and in countries where there are no Jews. It is hard to think of many other prejudices, really of any other, where the, which is held by people in country after country about, about other, another group of people who do not even live in their country. So it's the, the distinctive quality of anti-Semitism that, that makes the thrust of this question actually incorrect, even if there's an underlying truth to what the questioner was asking. Why is it that you think that in France particularly there's such an overwhelming out, outrage against Jews today? Well, it's not, it actually isn't just France particularly. France is in some ways more prominent. It's had more spectacular attacks upon Jews than other European countries. And there is no doubt that the rise of anti-Semitism and the vociferousness of attacks upon Jews has a lot to do with the Muslim, or the, immig the, uh, the Muslim immigrant community and Arab communities in different countries, which are powerful social and political blocs and quite determined to agitate against Jews in Israel and behind a lot of the attacks in Europe. And this is one of the reasons that the future for Jews looks ever less rosy and ever less possible in Europe because these groups are growing. They're not assimilating very well into the larger society and adopting the more liberal, tolerant, pluralistic values, even if there is a lot of anti-Semitism among native-born Europeans. Uh, they're still far more tolerant and far more open and accepting than the immigrant Islamic and Arab populations. And, and their growth and their, likening, and their likely increasing influence and power in the society will make it that much more difficult for Jews and Jewish communities to, to exist. And so they have a lot to do with it. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.